On behalf of the Board of Trustees, it's my distinct honor and express appreciation to uh, David for creating this body of work. I've known David for over 30 years. Uh, don't hold it against you, David. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I've watched his work develop over many years in many different materials and mediums um, and processes. And uh, there's a unique story behind this body of work, which is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Robin Rice, uh, to my far left, um, is the curator for the exhibition. And she's the co-chair of our exhibitions committee. Uh, she has many accomplishments. I'll just mention that currently what she's working on is a, an exhibition called Glass from the Creative Glass Center of America at Wheaton Arts at the Hunterton, uh, Hunterton Art Museum in New Jersey. So I encourage you all to see that. That closes in May. Um, she, Robin will be introducing the panelists, but uh, I'd like to say thank you to each one of you for your time um, and sharing your insights and talking with David about this body of work. And I know this is going to be open for discussion to, to you all, so feel free to gather your questions and uh, put them forth when the time comes to be. So Robin, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think this is going to be great. I'll tell you the plan. <coughs> we have three panelists, Gerard Brown, Susan Hagen, Willie Williams, uh, not speaking in that order. And they are each going to give a short presentation, not necessarily specifically about David's work, but that interacts with David's work or relates to David's work. After that little presentation, we can ask a few questions uh, and then, but we'll move on. And then after they've all spoken, they are invited to ask questions of David so we can put David on the spot, and you in the audience also can do that. And then after that, we have some questions for them, and then a giant free-for-all, if we still have time. So uh, that's the plan, and I wanted to say a little something about David. Uh, um, oh, I don't know, oh, if there's a mic. Feel free to use one. Uh, are they on? No. Turn it on, right? Can can you all hear me? Maybe I, I always. They used yeah. to tell me I was way Hello? too loud when I was Probably young. Loud. Too loud? No. Too loud. Okay. okay. How's that? Is that good? Okay. I wanted to say a few things about David for those <laughs> who don't know David. Thank you. And um, or his work. David is a sculptor and arts administrator. In sculpture, he deals with spiritual and material concepts that are both topical and reflective of his life's experiences. So you can look for a then and now character, in a way, in his work. He has an interest in world religions, systems of communication, and historical and archaeological monuments. His memory is phenomenal. He's kind of scary. Um, David's received his MFA at Temple University Tyler School of Art in 1971 and his BFA at Howard University in 1968. His sculpture has often been conceived for performance and includes interactive works. An ongoing series of freestanding sculpture and installation works, that's the work you're seeing in here today, uh, subverts the communication system of Bale, Braille, <laughs> not Bale, <laughs> he sneaked into this, of uh, Braille to address the pervasive human tendency toward idolatry. Bale would like that, though. A multi-year <laughs> multi outdoor project in its formative stages will involve the efforts of students of landscape architecture, David, wants to plant gardens that include braille, circles of braille, five feet in diameter, that will have convey words and ideas. I think it's a great. David's many solo exhibitions include Peel House Gallery, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, Washington, DC, uh, Visionary's Journey, uh, that was a solo show at Noyes Museum of Art in Oceanville, New Jersey. Exhibitions at the Slot Foundation here on the Penn campus. Significant group shows include the Anti-Apartheid Exhibition 
in Amsterdam that was organized by Tom Wolf, Reflections at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum in Ridgeville, Connecticut, the Second World Festival of Black and African Art, that was Festac, that was a famous show, uh, at Racetrack Gallery in Lagos, Nigeria, and the 23rd Corcoran Biennial. So now we know about David. Susan is going to be the first uh, person to present a very short, uh, I don't know whether to call it a little talk. Uh, talk yet. Talk on, on my dates. Um, Susan Hagen was born in Champaign, Illinois. She grew up in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, and currently resides in Philadelphia. She received an MFA in sculpture from the Cranbrook Academy of Art and a BFA in sculpture from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. She works primarily in the medium of carved wood sculpture, and recent projects include Citizens, that was shown here. Uh, a group, a series of sculptures, or I should almost say part of it was shown here, that focus on ordinary people and subcultures who make up the fabric of urban life in Philadelphia. For this project, she is collaborating with social organizations like Project Home, Our Brother's Place, to work directly with people affected by homelessness and those in transition. Protesters, community gardeners, and skateboarders are also participating in this project. Susan's work is represented by the Schmidt Dean Gallery in Philadelphia and has been exhibited in museums and galleries throughout the U.S., such as the World Tattoo Gallery, Aaron Packer Gallery, Sofa in Chicago, Del Mono Gallery in Los Angeles, Talk about tattoo <laughs> Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, Tidecap Gallery in New York City, Miami, Basel, or Basel. Public collections include the Center for Art in Wood in Philadelphia, where you are right this minute, and the Tweed Museum in Duluth, Minnesota. She is an associate professor at Bucks County Community College in Newton, Pennsylvania, and also teaches regularly at Penland and Anderson Ranch. She has written hundreds of articles about art for publications and blogs, including the Philadelphia City Paper, Woodwork Magazine, The Art Blog. Ms. Hagen has received fellowships from Ballin, Ballin Glen, am I pronouncing it right? Ballin Glen? Art, <laughs> close to say, what is it really? Ballin Glen? Ballin Glen? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I learned something. Uh, the George Sugarman Foundation, the Leeway Foundation, Ragdale Foundation, and the Independence Fellowships in the Arts. Wow. Okay, um, and her topic is Nine Gates. Thank you, Robin. And it's a real pleasure for me to be here today and be part of this discussion about David Stevens' work. Um, thank you, Albert, for organizing this exhibition, and thank you, Robin, for curating it. Um, I have a, I prepared some. Uh, points that I want to talk about, and I'm calling them Nine Gates. Um, I want to pose these ideas as entry points to understanding the work of David Stevens, and I really think uh, what I want to do is kind of give an outline for a talk, so this isn't really the talk, because I don't have much time. So I'm still sorting a lot of things out. The gates and the number of gates is really pretty negotiable. I got the idea for Nine Gates from the poet Jane Hirschfield, who wrote a book on understanding poetry through these nine channels. Um, the channels that I chose are really pretty random, and I honestly feel like there could be 11, 27, or even 99 for David's work. So I just want to start out with a few. Whoops. Okay, so there's the first gate. And I just want to kind of open up the idea of these different types of entry points with these images. Not that this is anything direct. Um, a wooden picket fence, uh, Rodin's Gates of Hell, uh, Christos Gates in New York City, uh, Japanese Gate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This was a gate that was the entry point into a gated community. <laughs> I read the internet. Okay. Those are the first eight, and I'll get to the ninth later on. Um, 
One of the first gates that I like to think about is old wood houses. Um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, where David has spent part of his life, there are these houses called shotgun houses. And I think they're a really interesting way to think about David's work. Ordinary things, um, not fancy, usable, built things. And here's an example of a piece. I don't have the title, Robin. Can you help me? I don't know it's, either. Is it print? It's a cross. It is a cross. I think that was in the Gallery Joe show. With slats. Who was that slout? Who was that slout? Was that slout? Oh, I don't think it was. I no, maybe it was. Maybe it was. Yeah, I, think I can't help. <laughs> it's an example, and I see that some of the imagery of the houses in the house. Um, also, ordinary things, build things, DIY things that you can build yourselves. Um, things that you can construct with a minimum of tools and training. And I really love that about these structures. Maximum imagination without a lot of necessarily resources. Um, the second gate is James Hampton. Um, whoops, what happened? Okay, there's a view of uh, into the garage in Washington, D.C. where James Hampton built the throne of the Third millennium? No, what was it called? I should have written down the title, but there's a view into the garage. Um, why is it there? It's because there we go. It's the third. Third. Okay. It's the Here's a better view of, uh, well, it's not necessarily a better view, it's a later view of the work after it was installed in the Smithsonian. And you can see a little better what the um, objects look like. The throne in the center. And they were all made out of found objects covered with foil. Um, again, ordinary things, not fancy, but he made them fancy. Uh, transformed into this visionary place. Um, insider, outsider, uh, a passage to the next world, uh, gateways and transitions. And the idea of auguries and omens, I think, also fits into this, that Hampton is this visionary artist, and I really see David that way, too. Um, this kind of segues into churches and church furniture. That's my third gate. This is a view of a church in my neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, I think Sisters, it's their church, their chapel. And church furniture. Um, here's a shot showing a variety of church furniture items that you can purchase. I found on the internet showing all the dimensions. Thought, wow, you could uh, build yourself a little church with these things. Uh, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about David's work in this context. The politics of oppression and hope, the chairs and the furniture of power or control, and even thrones, uh, which goes back to Hampton as well. There's a shot of what's behind me here. Some of the, the throne-like images that I see in this group of work. Um, if, and there's something also kind of disturbing about some of the imagery. Um, these are chairs. Um, yes. Benjamin Rush designed these chairs. And they were used in um, Eastern State Penitentiary and other places to confine people. And they kind of, for me, they link to the idea of control and power and the lack of control. And even in this shot of a dental chair, um, you know, some, there's something about some of these structures that scares me a little bit. There, you know, this is a very comfortable, wonderful design, but it's still a little bit scary. <laughs> Machines. This is the, the next gate. Um, there's there's imagery of machines in a lot of David's work that is funny and also scary. Um, he does ask you to think about the use of machines in our lives. Um, and there was a quote I read: "Today our idols include the cell phone and the computer." 
Um, and I think the work asks you to think about the extent that machines have taken over your life. Instead of using them as a tool, they control you. And I think it's an important thing to be aware of. This is an early computer. And there's my computer with this talk on it. <laughs> Um, the next gate I think of as the space between words, and um, this is an image of peeled turf, which is right behind me. I don't know if you see it. All the traces. Um, and I started to think about the space, the, the flat, two-dimensional surface behind the bumps, the space between words, communication, comma, not. Um, or nonverbal communication. Um, it, it kind of plays with my mind this way. There's a brain on of it. And then Morse code. And I think it's also interesting to think about this as texture, that, that all language is a kind of a texture. And when you don't understand it, it's even more of a texture. Um, this is a work by John Cage. And he was brought up in one of Robin's writings, I think. I could go on more about this, but I just want to throw a lot of things out there. So I'm probably running out of time. And this is an image of actual peeled turf. When I Googled it on the internet, I wanted to know what peeled turf meant. And it shows a lawn with part of the edges peeled back. And it's apparently a problem um, created by animals looking for grubs. They peel back the edges. So that, that's what it looks like. Um, related to texture, also tactile and formal pleasures, the sensual and sensory world in gardens. There's two different kinds of very textured gardens. Fabric, cloth. Um, nubby textures. And this one that looks a lot like Grail, uh, although it's just all an all over pattern. Uh, okay, the next thing is rituals, memorials, reliquaries, and power objects, gravestones, and cenotaphs. Something that I see recurrently in David's work. Um, yeah, what? Louder? Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, and from a, you know, from many years back, I've known David's been interested in the cross as a symbol, as it was transformed from a symbol of death and torture to salvation and hope in around the 5th century AD. And the way it's been used in a lot of different, different expressive ways uh, throughout the world in different cultures. This is a reliquary. Uh, cross-shaped reliquary, and this is a work by David that I saw in the Gallery Joe show in about 2004. Um, the Clyde Cross. Oh, Clyde's Cross Bouquet. Clyde's Cross Bouquet. That is a very moving piece about um, an experience David had in his own life. And I, I love how a lot of this work relates to his own work, his own life very directly, but you don't have to know the story to appreciate it. Um, crosses appear here. This is another installation. And okay, moving on to the next gate. The stolen poetry of the Bible. Um, <laughs> I, I, it appears, the Bible, imagery from the Bible, text from the Bible appears constantly in David's work. He sees religion in universal terms, and I, I think he critiques it, and yet he celebrates it. Um, he's interested in the um, conversation between the sacred and the profane, the struggle and negotiation between those things. And I think his work is about that. Um, in a lot of the, the work, and I remember in the Gallery Joe show, there were pieces that had braille uh, inscriptions from um, using text from the Bible about enslavement, spirituality, and hope. And I didn't write any of them down, but there was a theme that emerged out of those. Okay. Oops. Okay, yeah. That thing's really 
deciphering and ciphering. And um, the, what I see, it, this connects back to um, a few earlier things I talked about, um, James Hampton in particular. The visionary artist provides the cipher, but the initiate or participant must do the work that um, David asks people that view his work to be involved in figuring out and establishing a meaning or, or questioning the meaning. And the work of ciphering and deciphering is part of that for him and for the viewer. Um, the work is about hidden things, doubt, and then um, these are uh, deciphering images. And there's, that didn't show up. Well, that's in the other room. You see that? <laughs> okay. Ultimately, it's about lies and truth. Um, and there's no universal. Um, way of understanding that. I think the work really asks you to try to establish that for yourself in your own life. It has a really deep and profound morality to it. And it's not in your face. You have to work at it to, to get it. Um, lastly, the last gate, gate nine. This is gate nine. <laughs> there are three lines behind three this gate. Um, and I'm going, I want to go back to the, uh, end with a quote by Jane Hirschfield from Nine Gates, the book that I used as an inspiration. She has a, a chapter, one of her gates, is called Facing the Lion, the Way of Shadow and Light in Some 20th Century Poems. And I think that applies just as much to visual art. Um, and I brought this up because personally, I'm, I'm a sculptor myself, and I'm inspired by David Stevens' rigor as an artist. And that's primarily what touches me. Um, in her book, Jane Hirschfield says, the true artist, and I'm, she says poet, but I'm going to say artist, is forced into a continuing precarious existence that must be deepened and further deepened before the vow is accepted. For giving oneself to the lion, or to art, is a vow, nothing more, nothing less, than whole, one's whole life will be asked. And it's David's commitment to his work over all the years that he's been doing it, through all kinds of difficulties that I find so moving and inspiring, and all of the meaning and the richness that he puts into his work. So thank you, David. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, do we have a, a specific question? Well, you keep it, because you may have to answer. Uh, we're going to move on to bigger questions, but if there's a question specially relating to this, uh, that you want to ask Susan right now? I just have a statement. Okay. Wow. Here, here's the mic. Those, yeah. All those mics can be put on. And uh, I don't need a mic. It's uh, you it helps your voice boom. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it helps my boom and voice. But uh, I think that uh, uh, Susan really hit the nail on the head Been in touched. a number of yeah. instances. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I think she had some apprehension at first, but she need not to have had, but I really would uh, uh, encourage her to develop this, not just for me, but for the fact that, uh, that she was so right on. I have a, I have a uh, little question, it may be a silly question. Mm -hmm. Do you think a gate uh, and I'm not really talking about David's work especially, but do you think a gate is sometimes there to keep people out? Ooh. <laughs> Whoa. Well, yeah. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, but in art, like, is that something that happens in art? I think so, but I think the artist puts them up because without any kind of work, the you know, the process would be somewhat meaningless. It would be mere advertising. Mm -hmm. That you have to do some work in order to really understand and appreciate it. Okay. So I think they're necessary. Can I ask that you each have access to a okay. mic? 
There's a couple of floating around. Do, um, do we want to have, is there a question from the group? Yes. Uh, uh, Robin, why don't you grab the mic okay. and pass me one to give to the audience. Okay. We'll do it. All right. That's right, sit down. So you, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to respond to what Susan said because I think it's so true. And I think the gates yeah. may be the sense of the complexity that the artist is trying to reach to catch whatever experience they want to get that cannot always be caught easily. And um, they then become part of the communication that the viewer is willing to admit to. Yeah. Right on. Uh, let's keep that mic out here. Sure. Okay. And then we'll I can, the this one can go back. And I can you can no, share you, with you, uh, Gerard and I'll share with you. Yeah. Rob, hold one of them. We'll let them pass on. Right. And there's others. There. Okay. Um, I actually got sort of overexcited at the beginning of this uh, meeting, and I forgot to say something important that I wanted to say, which was uh, to thank Albert for, we, Albert has been thinking of this show since before the center moved into this building, and it was intended to be the first show, and various things went wrong, and it, and it didn't happen. But I think the show of David's work is kind of a symbol of the growth and reach of the Center for Art and Wood as it's found a new building and uh, it's expanding the ideas. It's not rejecting anything, but it's adding more. And this show was hard to put up uh, because these are large pieces and they had to be installed in the worst of the weather that we've had this winter. And it was kind of a nightmare, but uh, we got through it. And I, I, got to talk mostly on the phone. Other people did really hard work. Um, but I just want to thank Albert and the Center for doing this show. I think it's an important show for the Center for Wood. So thank you so much. I'd like to thank uh, Karen, our registrar. Yes. She really she did. saw that with installers. Yeah. Yeah, it was her first uh, show, I think, uh, at the center after she started this job, and it was really a baptism of fire. And she was, she was great. It was a baptism of snow. <laughs> That's fair. Right. A baptism of no, ice. ice. <laughs> so our next uh, speaker is going to be Gerard, and I'm, I'm looking for my paper that will allow me to say some uh, things about Gerard. Uh, Gerard Brown is a painter and writer. His work examines the uses of language and codes. His work is currently on view at the Philadelphia Sculpture Gems exhibit, Impossible Books, and the exhibition he curated for the Hicks Art Center at Bucks County Community College. Is it RW Reading and Writing? Is that the right title? Uh, reading and Writing Visual Experience is on view through March 8th. Oh, this was written before this, this <laughs> event was so supposed, supposed to happen a little while ago. <laughs> this event was supposed to happen in, in February. It was a great um, show. <laughs> uh, Gerard is an assistant professor at Temple University Taylor School of Art and the chairperson of the college's foundations department. And I think what he's going to talk about is relevant to these things I just said. I hope so. Um, thank you, Robin. Thank you, David, for all of the information you shared with me in preparation for this. Thanks, Albert and the Center for putting this together and everybody for coming. Um, I am going to talk mostly about writing and speaking, and therefore I don't have a lot of pictures, and therefore I won't have a lot of PowerPoint problems. <laughs> um, so I was going to talk about specifically translation with regard to the show, and in preparation for writing a few notes in the end, um, since I'm, I'm uh, there are some very specific points I want to make. I'm going to uh, read from my notes, so if you'll excuse me for that. Um, in preparation for writing about his work in a gallery after the show, I went to visit David Stevens' studio in late December, and I asked him how one could utterly, totally misunderstand his work. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that one could ignore the fact that it is to be read. Is that, is that a pretty good 
rendition of the conversation yet? Okay, please. Thank heavens. I began to entertain. Uh, I began to entertain the idea that the list of materials in his work should possibly be more elaborate than it is. The guy describes the sculpture and installations as being made of painted wood, and I suggest they should possibly be described as being made as painted wood and language. David Stevens' work is covered in thick coats of language. For me, this calls to mind the historian Stephen Roger uh, Fisher's descriptions of the ancient world as covered in writing that declared the power and wealth of its ruling class to an almost illiterate populace. Um, Rogers challenges the myth of an ancient world that was literate by pointing out that in the typical Greek household, the only person who could read was likely to be a slave who read to her master or mistress. This idea of being surrounded by things that one could read, whether or not one recognized them or could access them, is something that I feel is sort of familiar to the show, and it suggests the fact that David's use of language in such a way that is not transparent calls for some sort of translation. In her book on translation studies, which is kind of a basic textbook you would give anybody who's taking a college class in translation, the scholar Susan Bassman describes three forms of translation that we should think about. One is interlingual. This is the most common kind of translation you'll encounter, moving between two kinds of languages, carrying a text across from one language to another. Another is intralingual translation, one that is translated within a given language, such as the translations of literature from one period or region to another period or region. And lastly, intersemiotic translation, in which the work is translated across signifying systems, such as between literature and visual art. At first blush, it would appear that Stevens, whose braille writing stands in for words in English, would be engaged in intralingual translation. This act is sometimes called re-Englishing in our language, and it happens all the time with varying degrees of inventiveness. Romeo and Juliet is updated and transported from the mid uh, 20th to the mid 20th century. Having some technical problems with I hear a kind of motorboat sound. We're okay. Yeah. Okay. Motorboat sound. Okay, um, so you know, re-Englishing happens all the time, and you can think about popular culture versions of this, like the taking of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and it's updating and transportation to the mid-20th century, uh, mid-20th century New York by Arthur Lawrence and as West Side Story, and maybe uh, Leonard Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim, and Jerome Robbins were part of the intersemiotic inter translation, moving that from drama to dance and music. Um, and then there are you know, more, even more mass culture versions of this, uh, such as the Star Wars screenplays being backdated and transported to Victorian England by poet Ian Dosher. Anyone who spent any time on translation will happily tell you about the problems that occur when a text is moved across time or across language borders, and most of these problems involve the use of idioms. Idioms give us a chance to see how strange something is, how far it travels between languages. To keep things simple, we'll start with an example that's interlingual or moves between two different languages. Every semester in high school classrooms across America, the French greeting, Saba is translated into the English salutation, hello, despite the fact that it more literally means, it goes, or when inflected as a question, how does it go? Students are taught to respond, ça va bien, merci, or it goes well, thank you. And this all maps pretty well onto the English exchange, how's it going, it's going well, thank you. The world spins madly on, and no one really seems to care that these acts of interpretation which is really different from translation because interpretation concerns itself with speaking and translation concerns itself with writing, that these acts of interpretation are all being played out with approximations. But it gets tricky when you get to writing. Let me talk about translation. If you are reading a French text and one character says to another, ça va, and the characters are not social equals, for example, the greeting is being spoken by an employee to her supervisor, you're not going to translate it as, how's it going? you're gonna translate it as hello or good morning so that the French idiom doesn't intrude on the English uh, translation and uh, the, we see it rendered in our own language. So I need to concentrate a little bit on the role of writing in David's work a little bit more. Occurring in English, the only thing that prevents it from its immediate legibility is the script in which it is written, Braille. Idiom has nothing to do with it. If you walk over to one of his sculptures and you start reading, you will find what he wrote a list of names, texts, that are scriptural allusions, exhortations to give money. Braille is a specific form of writing that was originally developed in 1824 and refined over time for greater ease of use to fulfill specific functions. 
There's a specific system of Braille for writing uh, the representation of mathematical symbols and equations, for example. One can write Braille by means of stylus and slate, or machines for typing and printing publications have been developed over the near two centuries that Braille has been in use. Since the passage of the American with Disabilities Act in 1990, Braille has become a common part of the visual landscape in this country. Anyone who's been to the ATM today has had a little experience with Braille. Braille, while Braille is an important means of providing access to written text for those who cannot see it, it's also declined precipitously in its use in recent years. Its status as writing itself is not even universally accepted. The author Charles Mann describes Braille as a representation of writing, or a translation of writing on paper, rather than as a form of real writing. Nor is Braille, though it is capable of encoding other languages, in any way a foreign language in and of itself. In this context, it's best understood as a script, developed to meet the needs of a community of English speakers and readers and writers. So, what does it mean that a text in your own language is regarded as foreign enough to require translation. Doesn't such behavior indicate a kind of othering of the blind? Braille-dependent reader, scholar Georgina Cleage, writes of her experiences reading Braille in public. She writes, quote, if my Braille reading prompts comments, it is evidence that the blind, like other disabled people, are still invisible in mainstream America. Our habits and our paraphernalia remain strange and exotic. Blind people continue to be excluded from the educational and employment opportunities that would give them access to the sort of academic and literary venues where they would need to read in public. Cleage is outlining a few dangers here about the use of Braille. One is that Braille might remain unfamiliar and exotic to sighted audience despite its aforementioned presence in the visual landscape, and that its strangeness might in invite careless metaphor. Cleach spends a good deal of time talking about Anne Hamilton's well-intentioned installation of the 1999 Venice Biennale, uh, and how her use of Braille for symbolic purposes, uh, in her use of Braille for symbolic purposes, Hamilton perhaps unwittingly equated blindness with ignorance. In the context of this exhibition, the clear and present danger of seeing Braille as a form of language that requires translation is our equation of people in our own, writing in our own language with others, and our, concur and our concurrent failure to recognize a common language that's being used. This unfamiliar and exotic code distracts through its surface representation. What is an issue in David Stevens' work, I suggest, is not translation, but encryption. There is an old standby claim about translation that if you give a poem to 10 translators, you'll get 10 different poems back. If you walk over to David Stevens' work and read it, you get exactly what David Stevens wrote. Encryption relies on the ability to pass information clearly, if in code, between two parties, introducing as little room for misinterpretation as possible. Interestingly, to, your, to David's anxiety, the work might not be seen as writing. His concern that viewers might not recognize it is actually a strategy of, of code writing that was employed as long ago as in ancient Greece, uh, when writers sought to transmit messages through hostile territory by concealing them under layers of wax applied on wooden tablets. When a messenger was stopped at a hostile border, that, work, that uh, message might be checked. It would be seen to be an innocuous message, and then when it reached its target, they'd melt the wax off, revealing the actual message underneath. That technique is called steganography and is, in fact, still in use today in some ways, hiding a message in plain sight. By moving back and forth between literature and sculpture, David Stevens may engage in an act of intersemiotic translation, coloring the meaning of his texts by inscribing them on his work, shaping the meaning of them by embodying them in powerful physical forms. In this way, he is more like the concrete poets of the 19th and 20th century, or the poets whose use of figured or shaped techniques described by Dick Higgins or Charles Goldenhaus. It's up for debate, and that would be another panel discussion altogether one that I would love to be a part of. In my opinion, what needs to be translated about David Stevens' work is not the language itself, but the way his highly idiosyncratic and original acts of writing and sculpture sit in relation to culture in general, in relation to religious cultures that you discussed, in relation to contemporary African American culture, in relation to disability cultures. And for this reason, David Stevens' work requires much, much closer reading by scholars, critics, and artists fluent in these idioms and I look forward to that conversation when it comes. Thank you. So we can see.
turn that light off to the light stuff. This one? Sure. I'd like to make another statement. Okay. And that is... Uh, you can use that one. And that is that Gerard uh, himself uses Braille in his work. And he, of course, is his sight. Yes. And that's not, that's not, <laughs> but it's not the only symbolic uh, uh, type of system uh, communicate, communicative system that he uses, but it is one of them. I'm going to ask uh, Mike Lee to a kind of uh, simple, simple question. How much responsibility do we have as viewers to plumb translation, transcription, okay. encryption? Well, that's an excellent question. I don't know, I think that it, it's one of those questions that implicates institutions in display. Um, what I'm really interested in is how quickly things that are not written in ways that are immediately accessible call to mind the need for translation and what the implications of that are. That, that, that automatically seems to push things away from common grounds that they have with viewers. So uh, that's what I'm especially concerned about. But I think as we, as we worked on planning this exhibition, um, there were many conversations with David about how viewers would be able to access this text, how it would be decoded in the gallery guide, would it be summarized, or would it be word for word? Um, so I think all of those questions really are ones that uh, artists have to work out with the institutions that they participate in for the benefit of viewers. So, so you really think the context is the context is the gate. In a way, sense. yeah. It's, it's, it's not bad, you know? Yeah. Is, there, <laughs> is there a question from the audience uh, about this uh, for this moment? Otherwise, we have William Owens next. I think we need to turn on the. Uh, it's not No, the. Uh, you need to turn the projector on? Yeah, we need to turn okay. the projector on. Okay. Uh, I see a light. Is there. Yeah. Do turn on? Doing that, read a little introduction. Having talked so much about language, looking for things to read seems kind of apropos. Uh, William Williams' photographs are in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum, the Cleveland Museum of Art, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the National Gallery of Art uh, in Washington, D.C., among others. The Esther Klein Gallery and the Samuel S. Fleischer Art Memorial in Philadelphia, Smith College, Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Butler Institute of American Art in Ohio have all mounted solo exhibitions of Mr. Williams' work. His photographs have also been included in exhibitions at Historic Yellow Springs in Pennsylvania, the Baltimore Art Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, the Tampa Museum in Florida, and the Princeton University Museum. Mr. Williams' photographs are on permanent exhibition at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. He has been honored with a grant from the Ford Foundation and fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, few fellowships in the arts, Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, Massachusetts Council on the Arts. Mr. Williams has also received numerous faculty research grants from Haverford College, uh, where he has been the Audrey A. and John L. Dusso, is that Dusso. Right? Dusso. Professor in the humanities and curator of photography. So this is going to be good. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Better. Yeah. No, no, All right. no, no pressure. Uh, we've heard just two fantastic talks that deal with accessibility uh, and how to uh, approach David Stevens's work, which. Um, is really the, uh, the voice and uh, the gate uh, opener of the critic uh, for the audience. And I think this is just such a, a wonderful forum. They should have forums like this for every artist, every show. So uh, the museum uh, exhibition space here is to be uh, commended for putting on this type of public discussion about very important artists 
I'm going to uh, be talking about something that has uh, been of interest to me for a long time. It has to do with invisibility, and invisibility in particular uh, as it relates to African American uh, artists uh, and art making. And I'm going to start, or I'm starting with this uh, image that's in front of you now of Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley was, um, and I just touched my machine, which is very sensitive. Phyllis Wheatley was um, the, probably, the most important early colonial poet, black or white. Uh, what's even more remarkable is English was probably her second or third language. And she uh, wrote uh, extremely well. And her book was published, of her poems, in 1773. So she's the first published woman poet, uh, a book. And what's more significant about her book is that it had her uh, portrait in it. And the reason the portrait uh, was in the book was that people would know that Phyllis Wheatley was a person of color. Not only that, if you uh, read around it, it says that she's also a servant and who she's a servant to. And this is very interesting because the way that is put around the, the circular image or the oval image uh, encapsulates Phyllis Wheatley. But it does uh, more than that because as you can see, uh, she is in contemplation getting ready to write or she's in the moment of writing. And here is her uh, ink uh, well and there is a, a book. And this image confounds all images that you might have had of uh, slave or slavery in North America. So the image is both, it's contained and then it explodes outside of it. Now, this, I'm going to go to another image of Phyllis Wheatley. And let's see what's happening here. I can't do that, can I? Here, I'm going to select back. I'm going to do this. I had all this set up beforehand, but uh, it just won't let me do this. There. Um, so that's a problem. But anyway, so I'm going to go to another image. And this is a later translation in wood by Elizabeth Catlett. But you see, it's basically that same image. And that image is now seen from the front. It is also um, an idealized version of Phyllis Wheatley that's been retranslated. At the same time of the retranslation, you see the figure here is in thought. And at the same time, it's gazing out at us. This is an instance of where that original 1773 image continues to influence the contemporary artists. And we've heard about continuum and how it gets uh, changed and how it gets translated and how it gets reinvigorated. And that is one of the uh, key elements here in David's work. Now, this work is primarily what we call monochromatic. The Phyllis Wheatley work is also monochromatic, that is one color. David's work is multicolored. And at the same time that it's multicolored, it's also multi-sensory. That is, it can be approached not only from light waves, but also from the ability, although it's no touch, uh, I would love to have one of those pieces where you can interact with the touch because that's a very, very important uh, part of this work, too, is its tactility. Now, I'm going to show you this image. This is uh, that image of Phyllis Wheatley, and let me just reduce it. I don't know why this wants to uh, 
work this way, why it wants to uh, just explode everything up. But here's that image without any context, the original context of what we saw. And what you're looking at now is simply a woman who's gazing out, and you can see the just the barely the quill pen there. And essentially, this uh, context has changed the meaning. This particular drawing is one uh, that celebrates Phyllis Wheatley and celebrates her as a uh, poet, as a color, and someone of learning uh, that was uh, used, it was circulated by the abolitionists to make the point that black people are human beings and that they're capable of an inner life, uh, in this case, a learned life. And This is this, uh, again, a later printing of the poem, or of her book of poems. And you see how it's really changed from how it was before uh, with the oval circle. And this is a, not as powerful an image because the table here was planted up towards us. And the hand and the eye are much more in line with each other. And so it's changed. But over here you can see it's still sweetly, uh, you know, what's it say there? She's a slave. Native African and a slave. And uh, it's dedicated to the friends of the Africans. So here it's uh, been changed again, uh, moving towards and working with the abolitionist imagery. Now, we're not too far from the traditional African American community in Philadelphia. We're also near the Liberty Bell. And the Liberty Bell, the reason it's called the Liberty Bell, not because of the crack in it, but because of the biblical verse, the pop of it, which was also adopted by the abolitionists. And here is the part that I think is most interesting. The image of Phyllis Wheatley that I first showed you uh, was published in 1773 in England. It was not published in North America. That image is attributed to a uh, slave, C.P.O. Moore. Uh, in fact, in the book, there's a poem by Phyllis Wheatley in praise of S.M. It's only later that an uh, annotated copy of her book, which is at the American Philosophical Society here, she mentions who S.M. is. She writes out his name, C.P.L. Moore. So what you've been looking at is the very first um, drawing that's been published by a person of color, as well as the first book of poetry published by a person of color. Now, Phyllis Wheatley is much more uh, celebrated than C.P.O. Moore is. But we know C.P.O. Moore because Phyllis Wheatley wrote a poem to him. She also uh, mentions his full name. Other than that, uh, he has disappeared from, uh, from history. And that has been a uh, topic that we've all on, on the panel been talking about, has been invisibility. Um, it's invisible, but it's visible. I'm, I showed you some images. I showed you a contemporary translation of that image. And then uh, I showed you uh, how that image was used uh, for uh, political purposes, and the political purpose being to uh, get across an abstraction, which is that we should be living by the, uh, the clauses that are in our founding documents. And that is, uh, all men are created equal. And at one point, of course, that was a, uh, a very radical uh, idea. And I want to, let's see here, I'll go to show you one other image and then I'm going to stop, but I can't get my machine to do it.
So I'm going to go this, 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 just great stuff. And but we I don't have time to tell you about all of this. So I'm going to stop. I can't select that image. Well, let's see. Here we go. Different controls. This machine is different. I'm going to go here and go up. It's small. This is an image by Robert Duncanson. Robert Duncanson uh, was uh, born in Fayette, New York. And that may not mean anything to you, uh, but if I said Frederick Douglass, you probably would recognize that name. Um, Robert Duncanson was born a free man of color, and he was born into a family of house painters. In the 19th century, being a house painter means something very different today. And generally, house painters were also the people who did the decorative plaster mold in a house. And uh, they were uh, very, very uh, skilled people. So they not only painted, but they also did the plaster moldings. And it's from that skill set and that tradition that Robert Duncanson developed um, a uh, and largely self-taught that he became one of the celebrated uh, painters in the 19th century. And uh, his work in today, it's in, the, uh, it's in the national collections in Scotland and Sweden, and I believe it's in uh, the Royal Collection in England. But this painting here, which is in the Cincinnati Art Museum, is called Little Blue Hole in Miami. And it's in the Hudson River style. Um, and as I said, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the great landscape paintings in that luminous style in, um, that was created in the mid-19th century. The painting uh, was dated 1851. And it has a double meaning. Besides it being uh, a wonderful example of uh, American uh, Hudson River School painting, uh, it also uh, has a, uh, another meaning to it, and that meaning uh, is related to the fact that this uh, is one of the stations on the Underground Railroad. And if you were a person of color and abolitionist, you would know that meaning, not only by the title of the painting, but also what it's, uh, what it's of. And Duncanson, for a long time, no one knew who he was. Although his paintings in the Cincinnati Art Museum, there's a very small amount of information known about him. And like many of the 19th century artists, and also C.P.O. Moore back in the uh, 18th century, their biography, their work, uh, has been lost, but it's always been in plain sight. And it's been up to the critics, it's been up to the audience, it's been up to the historians to rediscover it. So I think in many ways that this is one of the uh, uh, overt themes in David's work. Uh, it's part of a long tradition uh, in uh, African American idiom, and I think increasingly uh, that is an approach that any artist uh, could use uh, in a sustained way to create a, uh, a viable uh, body of work that's not only self-expressionistic, but reaches out to a larger culture. That is my set of remarks. Thank you. So are there any questions, especially for Willie now? Look at all these pictures. We didn't need to see them all. Well, you said <laughs> 10 minutes. And, uh, I, again, I brought them all. I just wasn't sure how we would go, but it would, went the way I thought it would go. And uh, Phyllis Wheatley is the woman. I so is Sidney Moore.
It feels to me like in the third picture that you showed of her, yes. she's turned, she's made into more of a silhouette. We, we see more actual detail in the first picture, uh, more facial features and refinement. And she's just sort of now turning kind of just into a dark skinned person. This is, um, was that Elizabeth Catlett's wood sculpture? No, no, not the sculpture. The, the oh, one that yes, was yeah. the last one you showed. That one. This one. The, uh, the one to the left of that one. That one. No, wait, you're right. You were right. That one. The one of the book. Okay. Don't you think? She, it's, it's just becoming almost a, a caricature. It's more moving toward. I'm exaggerating, but it's moving toward. Well, it's what I was, I wouldn't use the, uh, wouldn't be that uh, strident about it. Okay. I, would, I would simply say that the original inspiration <laughs> is so powerful and so original that the person who is retranslating that is missing the point. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure who it was that retranslated it, but it was not a person of color that did this. Um, and that would that could open up a whole other thing about African American art. Probably some of the the 19th century, some of the most important African American images, and images of African Americans are in books, so they're miniature. And I think that's interesting. It gets back to reading. Um, but that's what's happening here. Uh, and both these examples I'm showing you are in the uh, special collections at Haverford College. So I look at them quite a bit, and I just used them in my uh, African American uh, history of art class. So um, these are, in, you know, those books were there for many, many years, but they were only thought of in the abolitionist context of uh, the importance of Phyllis Wheatley, not C.P.L. Moore, and also not how uh, the image gets changed and how contemporary artists use it. I like the Elizabeth Catlett. I like the way she elongated the finger on her hand so that she, uh, it somehow becomes an agent of expression. See what I mean? Yeah. What's well, a thought? Is that the the gaze, the thought, typical, the inner light? Typical stance for thinking or right. contemplation. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's another iconic. It's the same gesture, gesture. but she's made yeah. it more. She's made it more of the iconic gesture of the thinker or thinking or contemplation. Yeah, that's good. Okay, our, um, questions especially for Lily, and then we're going to, yes. Would you mind just putting in a... We have a microphone somewhere. Would you mind just putting in a, in a nutshell uh, the correlation between the, the, the slides that you are showing and David's work, um, just kind of well, I, I also specifically, when I ask people to choose a topic, I don't know what Willie's going to say, so this may be irrelevant, but I said you can just, you can be oblique, but present something that might, that casts a light on his work rather than directly, always directly addresses it. So now we'll see what he says. Hey, Robin, I think you're right on. I, um, what it has to do with is how to uh, look at and how to appreciate uh, David's work. And I've given some examples, uh, historic examples from the uh, 18th century uh, through the 19th century through the 20th century. And David is, uh, is the 21st century. So a continuous line of sensibility that's needed uh, or that is, could be useful in looking at the work. So that's what I've done. And hopefully introduce uh, to all of you some fabulous uh, work that you might not have been aware of. But at the same time, it's a continuum uh, tradition uh, that David's work comes from. And uh, my summation, I uh, also indicated that this is a, a tradition that any artist uh, would find useful in sustaining a uh, creative enterprise. Is that sewn up? 
Yes. Yeah. I think a reference uh, in, in terms of uh, speaking of Duncanson. Oh, that's a microphone. In, in terms of speaking of Duncanson, um, I think that uh, oh, that, that you might uh, also have addressed the fact that uh, Duncanson was in, involved in Ball, uh, Ph. Ball, mm -hmm. and how that not only relates to your own work but relates to the fact that many people would probably not recognize the fact that at the very inception of photography in this country, uh, one of the most important uh, entrepreneurs of photography was, in fact, a collaborator with Don. Yeah. Well, that's right, David. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I get there's so many uh, ways that you could talk about it, but I could also say this, since you've got me out there, is that the, uh, the use of the landscape to pro as a protest or as a means of political uh, imagery, <coughs> the first uh, documented instance of that is uh, uh, with J.P. Balls. Uh, he did a, a panoramic history of black people in North America. And um, the whole point of this uh, panorama was to say that uh, black people are here in, in North America and they should not be uh, going back to uh, Africa because there was a movement. Uh, one of the great Quaker uh, uh, people here, I think his name is uh, Coates, was uh, for, the, uh, for back to Africa, for colonialization. And so was Abraham Lincoln. And that was one of the things that was in the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, uh, the pre-Emancipation Proclamation, that blacks, uh, their freedom would be going back to Africa. And uh, this is one of the political divides in the uh, African American community as well as the larger communities, col 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 colonialization or abolitionism. And that's uh, what's also represented in the painting as well as the photographs. Uh, and you're right, J.P. Ball is a, he's one of the great photographers, one of the great daguerreotypists of uh, his time. And he had the largest studio that his black and white people went to, this very posh studio. It was the same as Matthew Brady's. It was that, that lush. So, yes. <laughs> Okay, now I asked each of the panelists to ask David a question. Let's see what happens. <laughs> you were first, so you start. Oh, I do. Let me see. I've been on the tip of my tongue. I can just go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Right hey, go ahead. David, I've yeah. got a question for you. This is a curious space that we're in. Its name is driven by, you know, its, its name and its mission are driven by a particular material. I'm curious how you feel about your work being framed materially <coughs> in the context. Of well, my, in, my, in reality, it's all I had to work with. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so wood was useful to you as? Uh, uh, it's, it, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a pliable and available material. Mm -hmm. And um, had I not lost my sight uh, about a decade and a half ago, um, I, had, I had at the time, as you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, there is another exhibition of my work uh, on display here in Philadelphia at the, um, at the Scribe Video Center mm -hmm. out in West Philadelphia. And uh, as you and Robin know, uh, the work itself, because both of you exhibited parts parts of some of the work. Mm -hmm. And they were drawings, so I had been doing drawings. And I had, I, I, when I left graduate school uh, in sculpture, yeah. I transitioned to painting, although the paintings were spatial and were sort of challenging the idea right. of painting and sculpture and so forth. And then, but to a great extent after that, I, I did painting and drawing. Yeah. And so many of those shows that you, that Robin mentioned uh, at the Cochrane and at, 
at places like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Tom Wolf show uh, uh -huh. and so forth. Those were a uh, painting, and so I had, uh, had not really done any sculpture until uh, recently, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. until the, uh, in reality, until the uh, aforementioned Gallery Joe exhibition, I had basically mm -hmm. done a drawing and painting. And uh, so when I, and, but at, at the time that I lost my sight, I had decided to, to transition back to, to doing sculpture, not because I was losing my sight, but because I had sort of run out of, not run out, but I completed what I wanted to do in drawing. And so I was moving, getting ready to move towards sculpture, and then uh, and my, my sight really crashed on me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Luckily, I had done that because I, there was no real transition in terms of pitying myself, in terms of losing my sight. I was sort of too busy <laughs> uh, getting wood and stuff together to work on the sculpture. And I, had, I thought maybe I would work in wood. But the wood is a pliable material. When I was in graduate school, everybody was doing, um, a few people were doing cough sculpture, but uh, everybody was sort of doing welding sculpture. I never learned to weld. I have mm -hmm. a bunch of welders in my family, but I never learned to weld. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the wood just seems something available okay. and natural. Now, the problem that people seem to have with me and the wood is that I work with these big power tools. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have all digits. <laughs> Thus far. Uh, and I, I, so this show, uh, was a is, is, is a kind of terminus for me. Uh -huh. I had not really planned. I'm, I'm not going to do anything this large again, uh, in terms of individual units. But I planned. I'm working on 144 small uh -huh. <laughs> sculptures that uh, a couple of people in here had encouraged me not to just stop doing this and go to the Braille Gardens. Mm -hmm. uh, but the wood is the wood was available, right. uh, and then on some level. The wood has other kind of sensory uh, aspects to it mm -hmm. that uh, that welded sculpture and and, uh, and, and, and and carved sculpture don't seem to have. One of my right. good friends uh, does fantastic uh, stone carvings that on uh, some level belie the idea <coughs> of a stone carving. But the wood seems to one one it it at least at one time was alive, right. and I, as far as I'm concern is still alive and on some level is still very sensual mm -hmm. and it's not as cold as steel or stone. Okay. Thank you. That answered two of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted to go first. Okay. okay. <laughs> this is a really, uh, a really specific question. I want to know more about Kimbu's Mount, which is on the top of one of these the red top. Okay, well that's that that, that is Kimbu, but it's it, it's also the real the real aspect of Kimbu is in that um, seduced that large long thing. The central figure is Kimbu, and the cardinal Kimbu. Now uh -huh. I take liberties, of course, with religion since religion takes liberty in and of itself. <laughs> Kimbu is uh, is a uh, is a um, Melanesian god of some small uh, um, uh, Melanesian South Sea group. And um, so I wanted to use, uh, in that particular piece, I wanted to use, um, and not the piece that we're talking about, not the, uh, the, uh, the, the Cenotaph T-O-B-D, but uh, the Kimbu actually appears uh, in the center part of uh, Seduced by Royal Traffic. What happens is all of this stuff that you see around, including the uh, including the uh, the offertory and the uh, oblation, which uh, you are asked to give money, and I'm still asking you to give money <laughs> for me to continue working. Oh. But not yes, of course. Oh. But but uh, not just for you to continue working. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, well, not hit nothing. Uh, <laughs> this stuff is expensive. Uh, but also, one of the things that I wanted to also use the money for was as an aspect of religion. 
Uh, one of the things that I've, uh, I've done recently is, uh, uh, you know, with all of this background in terms of religion of myself, I don't go to church. I did, I tried it for a while. As a matter of fact, I was forced to for a while because I went to a Catholic boarding school. But that's in the story. Uh, so I've been listening recently to uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, and who I really, really, really like, whatever the Republicans say. Uh, however, uh, and so I listen to him. He comes on at 5 o'clock in the morning when nobody except me is awake. Um, and, but, and he keeps, you know, he really keeps me enthralled until he got around to tithing. <laughs> you can tithe, but I ain't doing it. Okay. That piece, what happens with that piece, it's, it's, a, it's a double sort of meaning. It's Kimbo's van. Van is what's a sort of temple that this Melanesian tribe used as their sort of longhouse. But it's where they, the men kept their, their sacred things, and many of their sacred things were made of pork. Um, and all, it's also a uh, temple to the goddess Sophia, goddess of wisdom. And what that temple represents is the place where all of the rest of this stuff goes. So that tower with the temple at the top of it is the only thing that's scale. Uh -huh. So everything else is full scale, and that's a scale model. So that gate and the offertories and the um, uh, the the, the, uh, the, the well well the yeah the thrones, and I wanted to get to those too. All of that, in fact, goes in that little thing up there. So these so it's a focus problem. These things are full size, and that thing is a model. And let me finish. Uh, the tactile aspect of you being able to touch the work, no, you can't touch the work. But one thing you can do, there are two benches or stools there, the, the, the uh, king's throne and the queen's throne. You can sit on those, and they have braille on them. So. <laughs> Which would be interesting to read later. <laughs> no, I, I, my question is really short. Sure. It's not a big question. Is it the red part that's the uh, Sophia Temple? That, that thing at the very top. That, uh, nobody, you don't know what I'm pointing at. Right, so right. Someone's pointing at it over there. Yes. No, the floor. What? Okay, that was my question. At the top of the center. At the top, yeah, top of the center, absolute top of the center. Yeah, and my, the second part of my question about Kimbo's Mouth was the ideal location, whether this is real, planned, imaginary, the real location for viewing your work, or the ideal location. So how does, is, is Kimbo's Mount a, a plan for a future um, museum or installation for all the work to go no, into? No. It's an imaginary place that we as viewers the word. Exactly. Okay. But no, 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 no. As I said, I'm making these 144 small pieces. And I actually, actually, I had uh, intended to at least have, I'm, I'm working on three of them at the same time, and I plan to have some images of where I am with the 144 small pieces. When I say small, small to me is, is like four feet, four by four. <laughs> uh, so, so it's not, it's kind of, <laughs> I, don't it, I don't consider it especially ambitious, I consider it as, a, as something to do while I... <laughs> just trying to do the math in my head, that's 144 four square foot panels, like just in terms of acreage, that's huge, David. If put together, each piece, <laughs> will, be, each piece won't be exactly, well, I mean, it becomes, all of it becomes extremely small if I ever really uh, get this real garden project off the ground. I mean, some of the, oldest, the smallest ones would be, my idea of these braille gardens, that, uh, that uh, peel turf is a uh, sort of example of nine small braille gardens. Uh, and so Robin had mentioned that, that the bumps on the braille gardens will be like five feet across. So this is the idea, again, of focus. So the idea of taking those tiny little braille bumps and blowing them up to five feet. Mm -hmm. Well, five feet in terms of the gardens themselves will be the smallest size. 
my ideal would be there, uh, in Holland they're talking about building a mountain. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to make <laughs> these braille bumps <laughs> off of a mountain. Like I said, you're back again. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that sort of puts the 144 in scale. Okay. <laughs> so what does the 144 represent? Well, it's, 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 a, it's a number that I use, and it's, it's from the, it, it's a, a contested thing. You know what it represents. Well, I want to keep it. The 144,000. It was already in an exhibition, and on some level, it represents, and I didn't, I, I didn't want to use the word, but on some level, it represents the ridiculous extremes that religions go through, mm -hmm. both contemporary and so-called primitive religion. So the 144,000 is, is, is used by Jehovah's Witnesses to represent those who are in fact going to heaven. But in reality, the, the 144,000 as I know the Bible and I read it to the extent that, uh, that uh, my hermeneutics are pretty solid for an amateur, uh, it's still supposed to be Jews as far as I knew. And as far as I can find in the Bible, I can't find any place in the Bible where that relates to Christianity. And so I can't, you know, so again, it, it's just the extremes to which religions go. Now, the religion, that, that Micronesian religion um, that Kimbu is the main god of, they go to some extremes from cannibalism to to uh, preserving pig parts mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as I guess a sy symbolically these parts are a gift to the spirit kingdom. So it's, it's sort of playing back and forth between those kinds of extremes. Let's get Lily in. I have a very simple question. It, it has to do with choice. How do you choose your color? How do I choose my color? Now that, that comes up on a regular basis. Uh, some of it is symbolic. Some of it is uh, what's available. Uh, but more is how, why isn't the color going off the deep end by being blind <laughs> and, and, and choosing to use color? Uh, basically, what I do is uh, people, what most people don't really, and that relates to, a, to another question that might come up. Who really made these things? I made all of them. I have assistants. They don't use my saws. They don't use the drills. I don't let my assistants use any of the power tools. Uh, they might start with the drill, maybe the drill to drill the holes for the brain. Mm -hmm. But uh, so what I use the assistants to do is to to make the grid uh, for the, the braille panels. So I instruct them in terms of how to grid out the panels. And then I use them to negotiate the colors. Okay. And that just takes a lot of negotiation. Uh, I know how these things look. <laughs> and because as I said, for 40 years, I was a painter. And I did drawings, and the drawings are in color. You will see if you uh, get out to the Scribe Video Center and see the drawings that I did in the 90s. Of course, Gerard, you know them quite well, and Robin, you know them quite well, because both of you exhibited some of them. Um, but so I have, uh, I, I think I know color. I, 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 at some point, if my sight ever is restored, I hope I won't be totally surprised. <laughs> can, you, can you just describe that negotiation about, you know, just picking, when well, I went to your studio in December, well, the cross was bright red and now it's not. Can you describe how that little conversation about changing yeah. that color went? What were the, what are the terms you use to specify that to your assistants to, to help make that? Well, you know, some of it has to do with the price of paint at the store. Okay, <laughs> you know, I asked the question, you know, that's what I want to know. I mean, that, you know, that's fun. That is part of the uh -huh. negotiation, and I do have to go out to uh, paint stores and, uh -huh. and so forth and negotiate. Uh, but then sometimes it, it, do, it does have to do with a kind of uh, mood. Right. 
for, for things. Uh, for instance, I'm, I'm working with these 144, uh, I call them saddlebag cenotaphs. So instead of making things as big as that Tower of Brothers Blood, that's what the TOBB stands for. Um, and there's nothing, there's, 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 there's something cynical about it, but not, not, not as in reality, the blood part of it. Um, but some of it has to, uh, those, those cenotaphs will all have a, okay, these are saddlebag cenotaphs. The, the idea of a saddlebag cenotaph is I had decided a long time ago to stop, I used to, I used to have an antique shop. Mm -hmm. I used to collect antiques, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I had the house and this, that, and I had so much stuff mm -hmm. until it was disgusting. And so, so at some point, when I got rid of all of that stuff, I said, you know, what I'm going to do at this, at this point is only collect nomads in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the years I worked at the corporate, I never had a desk. I always had a couch and a briefcase so that if I had to leave the corporate, I could do it in an afternoon. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I decided that I would make nomads gear and uh, look what it turned into. <laughs> so, so, I've gone back to that idea of making nomads gear. So these uh, saddlebag cenotaphs, uh, each, thing, each one of these will be a little cenotaph that will represent somebody on that, on that, um, on that uh, cenotaph, T-O-B-B. Whose name is listed there. Their names, right. a bunch of names, and their names of, of people who have passed. And, and that thing that projects out uh, under the, uh, under the, uh, the uh, Kimbu's um, mm -hmm. temple, that, those, those have uh, uh, things that say it on them. It says uh, by uh, their own hand, by the hand of others, by their own habits, by the habits of others. Those, uh, those, all that writing on there has to do with people who have passed. Mm -hmm. Some of whom were killed, some of whom killed themselves, some of them who were killed by the medical system, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so there are the, those four categories of people. Now, now you know, for discretion's sake, I uh, just put their initials and dates mm -hmm. so that uh, at some point I probably won't even know who they were. But it is on some level uh, a monument to, to people who have passed. So in terms of mood, it would be a fairly somber, the kind of conversation would describe that somberness of mood. And, uh, Somewhat. Somewhat, but on the on the, uh, the, the the saddlebag cenotaphs will all deal with uh, uh, one little theme that's in here, and that is that uh, star-crossed lovers. Mm -hmm. They'll all have that as a theme, although they will, and so they'll have, they'll be they'll represent certain calls. First was one of them that I'm dealing with has to do with if. What does if stand for? If stands for Isabel and Fleming. Those are my two grandparents. Mm -hmm. That of the six grandparents that I had, uh, I only ever met one of them. Mm -hmm. And that I had six grandparents because my grandfather uh, died, and, and uh, uh, my grandmother died, mm -hmm. and my father's mother. And, uh, and he married again, and then he died, she married again. And so they wound up being four people all together, 19 children. Um, so uh, one of them represents that. Uh, but there'll be sort of other couples, some of whom I will have known, and some of them who will not be known. And so they all will have a, a star, a cross, and, and some kind of heart, or some symbol of love. There's, a, there's a, one star cross lover sculpture here in, in this gallery. I don't think the others will look exactly Nothing like, like that. It, but no, they'll all be a composite. You they'll can get a star-crossed feeling from, from looking at that, maybe. Well, that one, that, how that came about, that was, that was not something that was totally intentional. Sandy Webster, uh, 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 a decade and a half or so ago, had these wooden blocks made and gave them to artists to do something with. Mm -hmm. And so, I started working on that back then. I wasn't able to finish it because she was giving artists two blocks and, and I wanted three and so we had to negotiate that for a while. So I never quite finished it and uh, 
And, but she took it in its unfinished state, and then when her gallery closed, she gave it back and I finished it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, give people in the audience, because our time is, is ebbing away, so all people asking quite any questions you may have for David, for the panel, or statements. Want everybody to speak one? They're they're looking thoughtful though. Oh okay. <laughs> David, I have a question. This yes. is Tina. Uh, here at the center, we've gotten a number of questions about just um, what kinds of things people can leave you on the the altar pieces that will help you do new work. So money, okay. but, but not just money. Uh, one person did me. Okay, let me let me let me speak about that offertory and that oblation. Those panels over it do say something. On one panel, it says. Um, alms for Allah, bucks for Buddha, change for Christ, uh, ducats for Dumbala, and essence for Esther. So since there was an essence for Esther, one person left me a little bottle of perfume. <laughs> okay? The other one uh, says give, um, give here, give now, uh, give much, give more, give often, only give. And so, so you can leave what makes sense to you. <laughs> you may, but emphasis you may on sense. Surprises. Emphasis on sense. S E N T S, not. Uh, I mean C E N T S, not S E N T S. I already got that. Sense. 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 I understand that you have your vision and that you have lost your sight. And I was curious as to what insights you would have to someone that was congenitally blind that would create something in comparison with what you have created with, as opposed to somebody that was sighted and then lost their uh, I, I have, I've had, I, I did uh, go. Uh, in my old age, I, I didn't go to a, a, a blind school for a year. Well, I didn't last a year. They put me out for 10 months. They graduated me because they wanted to get rid of me. They thought I was false. Um, I had, uh, the, but there were some congenitally blind people there. And I had very good interaction with many of them. Um, and then some of the others, the the interaction was very heart-wrenching. I remember one day uh, there, was, there was a young lady there uh, named Amina, and I had very good relationships with her, and she was congenitally blind, but uh, my, <laughs> I used to, I used to uh, say that uh, my interaction with her was to turn her from a lap dog into a pit bull. Yeah. Because she was very, very timid, and I told her that she couldn't go through life that way. And so eventually she, in fact, did start to like, go out. We had to travel on our own and so forth. And so she started traveling on her own. She would invariably get lost. And she would say, I don't want to, I said, no, go out there. If you get lost, you're just lost. Eventually, you'll find your way back here. There's nothing going on that you're going to miss. So, <laughs> so, so going out there and, and and then there was another, another young lady who was congenitally blind, and she had more troubles with it. And one day we were standing waiting for a bus on a hot day. And uh, so I was asking her, and I was older than most of those students, mm -hmm. so the other students, so I was asking her, what did she want out of life? And she said, you know, my greatest ambition is to see a tree. And they would ask me, at that time I, had, I, could, I could still see a little bit. And so I would uh, describe things to them. But I think that one of the things that, that people have to do is to, to try to look within themselves and follow a natural course. So I, had, I, had, I, had a, I, have, a, I have a friend who uh, told me one time when, I was, when, she, when she found out that, that uh, I was legally blind, you know, but at that time I could read the smallest print. Uh, and most of you who know me uh, knew when I was uh, sighted, you know, that 
that there was not even an indication that one day I would, in fact, be blind, this blind, and then some people still forget that I'm blind. Um, but uh, people, really, people really need to sort of follow and look within themselves and find out what ambitions they have. So this particular friend, uh, by this time, I'm in the blind school, and she, this is one of those people, there are people in your lives who can always find you, no matter where you go, they can find you. And this, that's how this friend was. And so she found me when I was in the blind school. And uh, it was uh, at a particularly important time to me because she's a very spiritual person. And I don't like that word, I do like the word religion. But she's a very spiritual person. And she, uh, so she found me at the time, uh, just uh, a couple of weeks later, my mother died. And so then she and I and her children, you know, I became friends with them again. So she was, I was making the sculpture and she was saying, well, you know, like, but you really need to learn music because you don't know you might lose all your life. I said, well, that's the thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... so no, I don't, I, I will not tell people to make sculpture or to learn music. <laughs> Um, I just want to respond. I want to respond to what David said because um, I kept when people say things that matter to me, like I repeat them ten times in my mind so that I won't forget them. Um, about looking within yourself and finding your course, um, whether you're sighted or not, life can be pretty mysterious, and you can feel like you don't know what you're doing or where you're going, and you can look in the wrong places for answers. And I think what David said about looking within yourself and finding your course is why is wisdom for everyone. Mm -hmm. Certainly I want to remember that. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? Oh, great. Okay, it's probably a good one because I'd like to know what kind of space you work in. Um, Tiny. Tiny? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I've, had, I've had humongous studios. Um, a friend of mine, I hope he's here, and I had a big studio uh, down on uh, 700 block Chestnut Street. And at some point, I probably wind up getting another another uh, studio, but I don't want a large studio because you know, in the space I have, I spend a good forty percent of my time looking for stuff. So if I had a really big space, I'd never get anything done. I'd probably just stumble around in it. And I said he had a phenomenal memory. And actually, he does. Be careful. Um, so are there any other quick questions? Or even short? Okay, uh, Don. Don, thank you for coming. Uh, let's see. He's swifter on his feet than I am. <laughs> yeah, David, my question is, um, what advantage do you see in doing your work now since you can't see it? What advantage do I, well, I, I, don't, have to, I don't have to criticize. <laughs> 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 I mean, so, so literally, I mean, what the one advantage is I don't have to worry. I don't worry about uh, how it looks, how somebody thinks about it, etc. Uh, the, the 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 real thing is in making it, and on some level, uh, the making of it is has its own rituals, has its own set of rituals, and believe me. Uh, uh, I'm a very ritualistic person in terms of the way I perceive, and so, so, and I think that on some level, uh, my doing all of the work myself and not, um, not passing it on to my assistants to a great extent has to do with uh, a kind of ritual. It's sort of my ritual. 
And since my assistants can't be there all the time, and I work at ridiculously hard hours, um, then uh, so so they are not. They are only a part of the ritual. So, but being a part of the ritual, part of the ritual, of course, is the is the gritting of the braille, and and uh, and I find less and less and less and less anxiety moving toward arrogance in terms of choosing the color. Hmm. 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 Yeah. I like your color statement. Thank you. They are very uh, very calm and cool. Even the, the uh, warm colors are still kind of uh, calm, calm and cool. Well, I, I, on, the, on the braille panels, the ones that, that, that are very pale, and that's because uh, some people like Robin that I talk to all the time were saying, you know, well, maybe you shouldn't paint this stuff in some other people's I like to see it in my godson. And we'll say, I like to see it. Uh, yes, he, he uses natural. He makes a work out of wood. He's a sculptor in New York. He makes a work out of wood, and he doesn't paint his. You say, ah, maybe I'm gonna paint it. So now I'm, I'm, I'm sort of painting it so that it almost looks like the wood except a, t a tiny bit of tint in it. And so in terms of those, um, those saddlebag cenotaphs, the 144 things that I've embarked on making now, some of them will be uh, colored the way these are, but a lot of them will be, uh, will be extremely pale, just with a, a, a very tint except that all of them will have that central red aspect to them. If you look at all of this work, there's something in it where there is a central aspect of it is that reddish color. Any, I'm sorry, the kind of mystery that tones. Yes. Middle tones. Yes. 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 So that's very well, that's what negotiation is about. Yes. It Coming is. to the middle. Yes, it is. <laughs> Any yes. more quick comments? I think we're yeah, approaching our... Yes. David, this is Alan. Hey, Alan, how are you doing? Thanks for coming. Congratulations. Thank you. I often say to people that a lot of people don't know it, but they're colorblind. Oh, people and are I'm colorblind. Really, yes, there's a lot of people that don't know that they're colorblind. And I'm really impressed with David's work because even though he's blind, he's seen the nuances between color. And he's able to do something very sophisticated with subtlety and relationship to color that people with sight can't do, you know? So I think it's extraordinary that David has been able to continue his career and do the kind of work. David, the sensibility of what you were doing in the early 70s and the tactile quality, the texture, and all like that, the use of materials, it's still there. It's extraordinary that you've been able to carry that through. And as you say in your comments here, these are things that knowing that you were going blind to envision these projects. Because I've often wondered how you're able to keep doing these complex pieces <laughs> and yet be blind. So I, I really want to compliment you. I'm very proud to know you and to know that you've been able to continue your career like this. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> I I agree. That's a, a good note. I don't want to cut anyone off, but that could be a good place to end to thank David for uh, really today and a tremendous experience in this show <coughs> and in all of his body of work so far and in what is to come. Oh, oh, and oh, you can't hear me? You can't hear me. Actually, Tina was a person I also wanted to thank. Tina, I wanted to thank. <laughs> She's right there holding her ear like she can't hear me. <laughs> Uh, and Tina is going is actually uh, involved in our planning uh, for the rail gardens that are coming up and the plantings for the rail gardens. So thanking her for that, Albert, for making this happen. <coughs> Wonderful, great panelists, Gerard, Susan, Willie, uh, and uh, David. Especially. Well, I'd like to thank Robin also. Uh, Robin's had to suffer through a lot with me, uh, going back and forth, and, and, and she somehow or other is a glutton for punishment, so she, she has decided to continue to suffer with me. So we were supposed to, we were supposed to have had some images of, the, um, of uh, those uh, saddlebag cenotaphs 
So uh, within the next couple of weeks, uh, if you want to see the progress of them, uh, you can contact Robin. And as I, <laughs> as I embark on doing that, she will be get, getting images of those. And then we also will let you know of our progress on the Braille Gardens. Oh, we might need to mention this show. Thank you. Uh, David also has, this is David, a moment for David. He also has a show at Scribe Video of drawing, he's calling them drawings. They're actually bookworks, kind of, in my opinion. They're very large and caustic paintings at Scribe Video. Uh, and uh, Friday is the opening reception. Friday is the opening reception, thank you. And uh, this is really worth, these are definitely worth seeing. And since I'm talking again, I, I have to thank, I know I'm going to still forget to thank people. I forgot to thank Boone for all the work he's done. Made, uh, he brought coffee today, he had to drink. <laughs> and uh, Rachel, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of people have really stepped up and, and been so helpful with this event. Thank you.